<laughs> I am back. This is again Mapex All Access. I have the wonderful joy of being able to on Mondays at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time to meet up with and have the access of talking with these great players. Would you please welcome everybody, Darius Woodley? <laughs> Thanks, Dom. Darius, thanks so much for joining me. You know, I, I go back and I've watched the several videos of your playing. And uh, just, you know, when I talk to different people and your name comes up, you have such a wonderfully deep pocket and you've got a very creative flair of how you orchestrate yourself on the drum set. I appreciate that, man. I, I definitely say it, it comes a lot from personality and uh, experience and just... Where, where I come from and just the different experiences of life, traveling and just, you know, different conversations of having with people. I, I like to incorporate experiences of life with my playing to just make it more heartfelt. So I really appreciate that. Well, that, that sure does come out, you know, and I want to go back to the, the, the early days because you kind of came out of your, your dad, you know, also plays music, but it's also a minister. So I want to kind of go back to those early days of what got you involved with playing, get, being involved with music, and specifically drums. Well, it, like you said, it definitely started from, you know, my dad and church. I grew up in church, a Pentecostal church. If many people don't know what that is, it's a very, very musical church. You have a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, uh, you have uh, maybe three or four different musicians, a keyboard player, a drummer, a guitarist. So growing up around that at a at an early age, my grandmother also played a lot of instruments. Um, she led choirs and did a whole bunch of different musical things around uh, the town of New York where I grew up. So it was just natural for me to just fall in love with with this with the music and drums in particular. Um, just watching all of my other family members. My cousin also played uh, the first Mapex snare that I ever saw in my life. Uh, the first Black Panther. I've had to be maybe like three or four years old. Like my cousin was the one who put me on. Like man, these are the snares. <laughs> like to this day, I think he still has it, like a thirteen by something. But just having that around me at an early age, and just having so many musical figures just to steer me in the right direction of what to listen to, and you know, just just the right path to go in music. It really helped me to stay focused and notice like it was a real gift and I shouldn't take it for granted. So how old are you when were you playing in the, in the, in the, uh, in the church group? Were you involved with playing drums there? Yeah. So uh, around the age of, I want to say four or five is when I started playing in church, like full time, like for a service, playing full <laughs> service. <laughs> honestly and then from there it just just started developing my strength i wasn't the best but like you know my dad is the pastor so he's like yeah it's okay <laughs> just let him play <laughs> he's just focused on preaching <laughs> <laughs> so here you are you're playing and now you're starting to hear all the different musicians you're actively playing with the band i mean you're getting experienced at an extremely young age mm -hmm. yeah that that honestly led to you know, my, my dad noticing the different talents and then around then, that's when the drum off was kicking off. So at the age of 10, 11, I was doing the guitar center drum offs. I think the farthest and the first time I, I did it, I made it to like the district uh, level at 10, which was I was competing against guys that were t twice my age. And so it was like from there, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. And then from there. It just led to me meeting different other musicians. I would do studio work at a young age, around like 14 and 15. I'm doing studio work, which helped develop my pocket, you know, things like that, my timing. So it was just, and then having people like my dad and my cousins who already kind of already did those kind of things, they showed me early, like the different tools that would be needed to get me to that level at an earlier age, like playing with a metronome or practicing to music, things like that. Boy, that's really fantastic, Derek. So a couple of things. So now, were you, did you take any lessons from anybody at that point? Were you being guided by anyone? Yeah, I was. I there was a music uh, school. Well, not school, more so a store that had a, a school in it. Uh, it's called Palumbo's. I'm not sure if they're still open. It was not too far from my dad's church. And uh, the music teacher, his name was Palumbo. Um, 
he used to just teach me like my rudiments and how to just notice how to articulate you know notation and reading it wasn't more it, it wasn't more so like how to play but just more so how to read and apply what i'm playing at that age so i took more so lessons on how to read and things like that where was Palumbo's? Because I, I, I think I've heard of them. Where, where were they located? Yes, uh, South Bronx. I'm not too familiar. I, I, I would have to ask my dad. He knows exactly where it is. But we're talking like I was maybe like eight, seven, like really, really young. But when, when I do find out where it is, I'm going to let you know, Dom, because it's yeah, definitely a pretty historic like music store. It was like in the heart of the Bronx. Yeah, so it was very rare where the location where it was at. So if you're into music, you kind of would have heard about that story. I, I, I think so, because that, that uh, it was in the South Bronx area, because I think I've mentioned I've heard players like Will Calhoun, who's also from the Bronx, talk about that and, and talk about that was a, a pretty, pretty active source. So you're in there, you're taking lessons. Who were you listening to musically at that time? So at that time, there were a lot of local drummers on the on the gospel scene. Um, I I have to pay homage uh, because I was I was blessed to be surrounded by a lot of the pioneers like of our generation and before our generation. So one in particular, Gerald Hayward, yeah. he was a major influence to my playing and just me personally at an early age. He actually knew my dad because my dad played drums back in the day, not on the same level as Gerald, but they exchanged, you know, gigs here and there. He played for a choir, my dad played for a choir, so they knew each other. So I, I remember getting phone calls from Gerald at the age of like 12, 13, just telling me to stay focused. And, you know, so I listened to Gerald a lot. And then I also listened to Steve Gadd heavily um, at that age. My dad put me on Steve Gadd, a lot of Dennis Chambers, a lot of Will Kennedy, a lot of Dave Weckl. So. <laughs> All of those real pioneers like Vinny Cauyuta, like I spent a lot of time with listening to, to those guys, getting a lot of different ideas, just getting a lot of different, you know, just approaches on how I want to make my own sound and just get my own identity. Well, good for you, Darius. That, that, that really is a part of the of the of the learning game to try and keep your mind as open as possible. When you go yeah. from someone like Vinny Cauyuta to Dennis Chambers, you know, that's a pretty wide, wide gap. And that shows that you've got a pretty open mind of who you're listening to and who you're taking in the music of, of all these great players. Yeah, definitely. And then from, from there, like those, those days, I would say like when I was heavily into those guys, it was from maybe like 11 to 14, 15. And then when I, when I got about 15, that's when uh, the shed, the shedding scene really became heavy when like drummers would, get four or five drum kits together. We just play for hours and just share ideas. And growing up in New York, I mean, a lot of the most amazing drummers right now to, to date, I grew up with like Carlin White. He's also a Mapex drummer. Yeah. Like we knew each other since we were 12, 13. We'll be shedding at his dad's church. Also uh, Sharik Tucker, he ended up winning the drum off a few years ago and ended up playing with Stanley Clark. Like yeah. we did the drum off when we were 10. He's from New York another drummer by the name of Isaiah Johnson. Like we went to college together. We, so we will all just sharpen each other and then all ended up growing up to still do what we love to do in music in our own different ways. So I definitely have to pay homage to a lot of my peers because they influenced me so heavily and helped me to, to grow as well and stay on top of my game. Well, that's really a, a great, a great line. You know, I always say, you know, that we use steel to sharpen steel. Steel sharpens itself. And mm -hmm. it's man that sharpens man. Mm -hmm. And if, if we really kind of open ourselves up to listen, there's a lot that we can learn from and develop from, which is exactly what it seems like you've done. Yeah, man, definitely. Like, I would always approach a shed like, man, this is an opportunity for me to learn. I feel like that, that art of it is kind of lost in today's culture. You know, it's more of a competition, but it's like, we would end up being like, man, wait, we got to stop everything. Break down what you just played or can you just, you know, it's like just the appreciation for the culture. That's what I, I, I really grew up around. And I, w I would love to see more of that with the younger generation, you know, coming up together. Boy, that really is fantastic. You know, I'm going to put up a couple of things here. Check, check this out. I'm going to put this up here. This is uh, Bruno Muse, who is a uh, phenomenal drummer from Antwerp, Belgium. Wow. 
here is Lori Bennett playing before he could walk our little drum. Wow. This here, right? Dom, Dom, let me, that, those are my, that's my downstairs neighbor. I would be banging on their head for hours, <laughs> on hours. I'm talking about one, two, and up till, till I was 10 years old. I love them. <laughs> they introduced me to jazz, like, rest in peace, Mrs. Bennett. Uh, her, her mother just passed recently, uh, old age, 90s. Um, but Mr. and Mrs. B, I, I love them so much. Like, they got my heart. Like, that like, is... Mr. B was an amazing piano player. He would just play jazz, and I'd be upstairs trying to, you know, jazz, play with him. I'd up just going downstairs, and he just put me on to a whole bunch of stuff, Art Blakely and all those guys. So, I, like I said, I was just surrounded by a lot of musical you know, people at an early age. It just really helped me out, man. I well, really what, appreciate that. What an absolute blessing. Laurie, at some point I want to meet you. You sound like a pretty special person, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We have here Sergio Belotti, who's one of the top teaching educators in Boston at Berkeley College and also has his own drum shop called 20. Wow, bless him. He's joined us from Boston. Thank you, Sergio. We have, look at this one here. Fluvio Borelli is saying hello from Rome. Rome. Thank you, Fluvio. Ah, Rome. I, one of my favorite places. And here's Victoria, <laughs> who's a phenomenal female drummer. Ukraine. With a band called Symphomania. And she's from Kiev, Ukraine. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. That is fantastic. Well, so we've got some Thank great. Thank you, Victoria. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So let's let's move forward now. Now you're in school. Are you are you getting together with other musicians outside of church and jamming with them? Are you starting to play with and meet other musicians? Yeah. So uh, I would say at the age of fifteen was when things really took a a different turn for me musically. There was a gospel group uh, locally by the name of Lavray. This this group honestly is one of the reasons why I'm able to even do things on the next level, you know, past the church, because they got a record deal early with uh, MBK Entertainment, which was the management for Alicia Keys mm. um, for maybe like all of her early years, all of her early years, her, by the name of Jeff Robinson is the management. So he signed this gospel group um, and we were just on different different platforms of uh, stages at an early age, like all of the top gospel um stages, T.D. Jakes, Potter's House stuff, a lot of the award shows. So I'm like 15, 16 at this time. We're even doing shows in clubs for R&B and rap artists because it's a part of an R&B group. So they're like, all right, we're going to start the show off with a gospel group to, you know, give inspiration. So I'd be in the club at 16 with X's on my hand. So the bartender, know, don't don't sell him any drinks, you know. <laughs> like my dad would be showing up with his suit on after church and club gigs and everything like, oh, that's your son. Oh, he's amazing. You're like, yeah, like at an early age. So I learned how to be respectful. I learned how to move. And I was on the scene with a lot of people who were already doing things on the level that I was trying to get to at an early age. So we would do all of these performances. At the time, I wasn't getting paid at all. It was just for me, you know, wanting to do what I wanted to do. And knowing like this is the route I need to go. So then from there, um, we ended up doing an album. The album was Stellar Award nominated. The, the first album, the first time the album ever was released, it was Stellar Award nominated, which is very rare in gospel. Um, the group is no longer together, but that same band ended up getting a call to work with 50 Cent um, in the studio. Shout out to my brother, Sean Thomas, who is a amazing keyboardist and producer. At the time, he was playing in church as well as producing a lot of songs and getting called to do a lot of uh, studio work for artists like Lil Wayne at the time, yeah. P. Diddy, Jeremiah, um, a lot of R&B and pop artists. So he got the call to work with 50 Cent and go and play some keys for a record. And at the time, Shout out to Nissan Stewart, Rapture, Charlie Burrell. They were the band for 50 at the time. But as you know, 50's on the East Coast. Yeah. They're on the West Coast. At the time, they're working with everybody. You know, Nissan and Stewart is working with everybody uh, at the time. So it's kind of hard to get the band together when you're 50 and 
you're trying to just go overseas real quick and your management is not really all the way together. Your business is not all the way together. You're not giving guys enough notice of time and it's clashing. So it ended up, you know, becoming a conversation like, yo, I love what you're doing in the studio. Um, I won't do, do you know any other musicians? You know, are you part of a band? And he was like, I'm actually in a band with my, with my brothers. We're all from the Bronx. If you ever need anything, just, just contact us. He's like, yeah, I have a show in France in a couple of weeks. Um, you want to come to a rehearsal? I want to see what you guys are about. Yeah. We went to that rehearsal in 2009. We went to France that next week and I've been 50 cents drummer since then to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So you got you got to imagine. So you're still basically still in high school. Yeah, that the gospel group was happening while I was in high school. Like I, I didn't even go to my prom. I had a show in the Bahamas in the <laughs> Nassau Bahamas with this group. We did some kind of like big festival, gospel festival out there. So I didn't even go to my prom. I was out there. <laughs> I think that's a that's a really good reason not to go to your prom. I also did not go to my prom. I worked, yeah. gig, you know, that you know, I got paid very well doing a gig when my prom happened. So I also did not go to my prom and I don't regret that at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it just, it just happened like that. When you got that feeling and you know, it's just, but I was still focused on school, <laughs> but I just knew music. Cause at the time I was also very good at basketball and I, um, had injured myself pretty heavily, so I had to really make a decision, like, do I want to really do music or do I want to do basketball? And I, and I chose to really go with music. And that's when a lot of more opportunities and doors started opening up for me. Interesting. So so at this point now, you, you hook up with 50 Cent, and your first trip is, it, was, was it the Bahamas? Is that Was that the first gig? No, no, no. My first, my first show with 50, I'll never forget. Comar, France. Call my friends. friends. I will I will never forget the place, location, never. That was a it was it was my first major show. It was maybe about forty to fifty thousand people. So just describe that feeling. You're like you're young, you all of a sudden now you're taking the transatlantic flight, you gotta get your passport, and you're flying to France. Well, I already have my passport. I already had my passport, thankfully, because like I said, that gospel group, we were we were already doing things on that level to have to travel. Like we went to the Bahamas, we went a few other places and traveled overseas. So at a young age, you know, shout out to Jeff Robinson, because from there I was working. Also, her was on that label at the time. Her name was Gabby Wilson. Right. Um, Tyrese, El Varner, Latoya Luckett. So we would do showcases um, and be the house band for all of those artists at so I would be playing for five or six artists in one night in different states, whether it's, you know, South by Southwest or wherever. And this is all before I'm 18. Wow. So, but that first experience with 50, like that's, that was my first major, major, like traveling in front of a humongous crowd. So for me, it was just knowing like, all right, it's destiny fulfilled, you know, yeah. like, this is what you worked for. This is this is now the next chapter of your life musically. Big time. That's that's how I saw it for me. It's like now it's like everything you've worked for up to this point has prepared you for where you're about to go next. I didn't feel like I arrived. I didn't feel like I did it. I felt like you worked hard enough to get here to get yourself to where you really want to go. So that's really how I felt. And I was just more appreciative and thankful to know like what I was about to experience and to just know like don't don't get it taken away do what you got to do to propel yourself well this is a, this is such a great personality uh, attitude that you have Darius because you really kind of understand the gratitude of the wonderful opportunity that you have had to travel and play music and lift people up with the power of music i mean this really is an amazing journey yeah yeah, man, definitely. That's that's always been my my prayer too. Like, because I come from church, so this is a gift for me. And I always always pray and ask that somebody's life will be inspired, or somebody will be changed, or somebody's mood will be uplifted by the gift that I am giving. Every time, whether it's any type of music, whether it's production or in church or any stage, 
like well this is and i've i've always gotten like man you 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 inspired me or you blessed me or like i i really appreciate your gift and that means more to me than anything in the world <laughs> like it's like the job was accomplished well beautiful beautiful attitude darius this really is the the key for, to where success allows us to open doors that gives us opportunity and yeah. continuous opportunity in our life if we have the right personality and the right attitude and have the right skills with your craft to deliver. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is when you sit down to play, you've got to deliver. Yeah, definitely. You definitely have to deliver. But what with comes with but what comes with being able to deliver is having the right spirit and having the right personality and you know like just feeling good about yourself because what you play comes from somewhere and i was always taught i was taught that by my big brother travis sales who's not even a drummer he's one of the best pianists organists and producers of our generation and a lot of other um people influence me off of my gift like you see michael jordan like i i get influenced by a lot of other things other than music and drums. And it's like, basically what's in your heart really shows off of your instrument and, and your craft. And what you come into starting out your day could have an effect on if you deliver or not. Like whatever conversation you have with the guy who gave you your coffee, if he messed it up, you know, you let that mess your day up, it could change your whole vibe up and you won't be able to deliver. So if you just try to always keep a fresh mindset and an open, approach to just life and just being of service the delivery will be consistent and that's always that and that's always something that i've wanted like just consistency like when you know you call me or you come in to see me a clinic or whatever you know you're gonna get out of it more than what you expected which is the consistency boy you know it's 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 so great to hear darius because as a as a young person like yourself you are the kind of role models and the kind of leaders that we need, not only in the music industry, but in just life itself, to be able to go out there and lift people and let them see that by being a good person and by having a passion and following that passion really is a pretty powerful combination. Appreciate that, Dominic. You're, you're already doing that likewise, man. Like, as you were sharing with me earlier, your, your network of you know, students and just people and individuals that you're able to reach on a on a daily basis is inspiring, man. Like, truly inspiring. Just even having this dialogue with you now is like I'm. I just pray that a whole bunch of people are being inspired by the, by the minute. Well, I I think they are, and I think they are also from around the world. We've got people from the UK. Uh, Carlos Guzman just joined us from Florida. We've got Davin Malik. We've got some people from all around the world here. And I think what's what's great about this is it allows us to, for people to step into your world, Darius. This is so important. So now here you are with 50 Cent. So with 50 Cent, what, what came after that? What 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 led to the next? When did Rita Ora come in? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so basically being able to have that platform, traveling with 50, that opened up a lot of, other resources and, and networks with, with people because the festival scene was heavy, heavy, heavy. Yeah. Uh, I would I would be in a different country doing a festival every Friday till Monday. So I might be doing a show one week with Wiz Khalifa and J. Cole and 50s headlining. So I'm meeting all the musicians from that band, which is honestly like the first time Carlin, which is one of my best friends, we grew up shedding together, but the first time he ever saw me play a full show was in switzerland uh in 2013 we we were both on the same set j cole and 50 had a festival together he had never ever seen me play a show which is different like being able to shed and chop that's one thing yeah. well, you have to apply what you do in music and on the stage and with a crowd and with 30,000 people around you and speakers and click and if things go wrong how do you handle it that's another thing so the first time we ever even and the first time I ever saw him perform like that was overseas. So it's like being able to have the platform of 50 to put me in those arenas and those rooms to be Absolutely. seen in a different way yeah. is what helped me to get 
to the next level of working with Rita Ora's because the music director at the time, Steve Octave, uh, saw the work I was doing and Carlin was actually the drummer for that at the time, but J. Cole was taken off. So Carlin is like, listen, man, I got this Rita Ora gig, but I can't do it. Do you want to do it? I'm like, sure, bro. He's like, you were so killing out there in Switzerland, man. And then from there, that music director ended up working with a lot of other pop artists. I mean, and he's from the UK. Many people don't know Rita Ora is from the UK. So any UK artist that he would get that came to New York, whether it's the Today Show or whether it's any TV show, like I ended up doing Jimmy Fallon, not not Jimmy Fallon. Uh, well, I did Jimmy Fallon, but I ended up doing Jay Leno before um that whole tenure ended. So that's how far we're talking back, like with the Ricky Minor band, Teddy Campbell, and all those guys. I, I remember not even being legal at the time, <laughs> like, but I'm on the, the Jay Leno stage, and I'm to to be able to say that I was able to touch that stage among all the greats is a is a blessing. You know, so shout out to Steve Octave. He opened up a lot of doors for me um, on that UK scene. And it was honestly because of my brother Carlin and because of the relationship that we already built for years and him seeing me actually doing what I do and knowing that he could trust me if he needed to call me, just me being ready. So from there, that ended up, you know, me working with a lot of the pop artists and the UK artists like Rita and uh, a our our connection is getting it looks like it's a little jumpy the connection on this here uh darius so it's a little glitchy but but i think uh -huh. we we can still hear what you're doing let me ask this question was the jay leno show the first television show that you played no jay jay leno was not the first television show i played actually the first wow this is a crazy story the first television show that I played, I was still in high school. I did the BET Music Matters, uh, the BET Music Matters side stage for the BET Awards. Yeah. It was an artist by the name of Elle Varner. Um, so, like, at the time back then, she was also signed to MBK. That's how I was able to get that. The gospel label, the uh, gospel group was signed to the same label, so they just used the band because we were ready at the time. So um, I'm literally still in high school. It was the summer I was going to graduate um, before college. So I'm still in high school. And then months later is when I ended up getting that 50 call as well. So this is all the same time. Yeah. BT Music Matters, the side stage, you know, that's when they used to have, you know, the, the, the newer artists perform for maybe 30 seconds, then they'll go to a commercial. But when you're in the crowd, you actually get to see the full performance. So I'm I'm performing for every celebrity, every everybody there. That was my first major TV performance. I performed for maybe 30 seconds on TV. My check was fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> From that day, I knew like, wow, all right, this this is what I want to do. Imagine if I was playing on the main stage. Yeah. This was just the side stage, and I played for 30 seconds. I was like, okay, this this TV <laughs> stuff is a little different, especially the award shows. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that <Yeah>. is. <laughs> You know, there, there are certain similarities. Uh, a dear friend of mine, rest his soul, was Jeff Procaro. And Jeff Procaro, I met Jeff in 1976. And Jeff also, when he was in high school, left to go on the road with Sonny and Cher and just realized, he said, boy, he went out on the road. Wow. They started performing live concerts and doing television. He said, man, this, this is what I will do for the rest of my life. So I love the fact of hearing these stories. It reminds me to bring back yeah. a great memory of Jeff Procaro. Yeah, it was it was literally crazy. I I can I can remember it to this day. Like I I got that check, then a couple of weeks later I got accepted to college, and then like a couple months later I got the call for fifty. So <laughs> it was like, <laughs> what is happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that is absolutely fantastic. So so with the the working of the fifty cents, you're going. What was the next, the next, you started to network meeting more people. What was the next step? You know, when did, uh, you know, Camila Cabela come in? Or what, when did some of those acts, J. Cole, when did they all happen? Yeah, so again, Carlin was also working with J. Cole at the time. So another pioneer by the name of Rashid Williams, who's even the reason why I, I'm able to be on this call with you today, man. Shout out to Rashid. Yeah. You know, go, like growing up in New York, Philly's close, so... 
a lot of the guys, Rashid and Boots and all of them, like yeah. they really and Daryl, they really introduced me to Mapex at an early age. Like those were the guys that I really looked up to at the time. It wasn't really too many New York cats working. You know, we we had a lot of our guys, you know, shout out Jermaine Parrish and all of that, but mm-hmm. Philly at that time was just really a breeding ground for that scene of music that I was into, which was the hip hop and R and B. Even on the gospel scene, you had Spanky, McCurdy, and yeah. you know, Rashid was working with another group by the name of Benita Farmers. Like so, like Mapex, and it was it was just it was just heavily of, of circulating around, and I was like, I love that sound. <laughs> but at the time, staring back to the J Cole thing, Carlin got the call to work for Rashid with John Legend. So we already had a great relationship. He knew he could trust me off prior work. So he ended up calling me to come and do some J Cole stuff for him while he went and did the John legend stuff. I think Rashid was, I don't really remember what it is Rashid was doing, but it was, it was obviously more important. I think he was doing some Mapex clinics, if I'm not mistaken. He was, he was doing some Mapex clinics and he had a variety of different events that he was doing, filling in for with some top people. And uh, just an incredible yeah. young up and coming drummer who's now just killing it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just basically like just being at the right place at the right time, having the right relationship and being trusted enough that my brother would call me to step in and and do those things. So I ended up working with J. Cole for maybe like a few months. Yeah, I I think it was we did like a few tours. Um, And then from there, like it's like when you do one gig, it's like one job. One gig is honestly like the audition for the next. I, I can't say that enough because. You never know who's there. You never know what's needed or, or what's what. From from J. Cole, I ended up getting a call to do uh, Camila Cabello. She ended up, at the time, just leaving this group called Fifth Harmony. Nobody even knew who she was at the time. Everybody knew who the group Fifth Harmony was, but um, nobody knew who Camila Cabello was. So she had got a call to come to New York to do a label meeting with Sony. I, I don't know if it was Sony or whoever. Don't, don't quote me. Yeah, yeah, but um, they had a label meeting and they put together like a nice private executive performance for the for the label exec. So I ended up doing that show, and then um, ended up creating a great rapport with the management, a great rapport with Camila. Everything went so well with that show. That label put her on the Bruno Mars tour two weeks later, hmm. and um, because of how comfortable she felt with me as a drummer, and um just a person overall just business wise everything she personally requested from la that i be the drummer she didn't want any other drummer she didn't care who else was playing what other uh, what other instruments but because of how she felt about me and by the grace of god she called me and i ended up getting on the next flight to la we rehearsed for a couple weeks and then i did the bruno mars tour which was my first major tour um as a as a like just touring musician just on that level it was stadium that was my first like stadium tour um i had done plenty of tours like festival tours and things of that nature are different but when you do a, a stadium tour that's just a little different with, with you know load-ins and different things of that nature is just that was a different experience for me so what was that like to get to get acclimated to that because you got to kind of get adjusted listen the stadium tours that's an entirely different level and especially with bruno mars with that mm-hmm. that you know, name that you're, what was that like to get adjusted to be able to do those those stadium tours? It was honestly like I felt the same way I felt on that first show with Fifty. It's like, all right, you worked your hardest to get here. I, well, that was my first stadium tour in the states. Mm-hmm. I had did a stadium tour with Miguel. Um, we opened up for Alicia Keys, um, and like the youth. Uh, what is it, the O2 arenas and things like that. Right, right. But even with that, that was just a little different because it was only for like two weeks. This tour was like a month and a half straight stadium. So for me, it was like, all right, you're here. This is what you worked for again. Like, just focus up. This is going to get you to that next level. Right. I just never, ever saw anything as like, all right, you made it or you did it. It's always, it's always more to go. So from there, I would just make sure I do my job. But I, 
would approach it as, all right, you're here with all of these, you're here with Bruno Mars, you're here with all of these people. It's not just about playing at this point. Make yourself, you know, of, of value in, in different ways, however it is. So I would network. Uh, Panda, well, that's that's my homie, Eric Hernandez, who's Bruno's drummer at, you know, everybody would love to get a relationship and the, and the rapport with, you know, somebody like that. But, you know, you just got to go about it the right way. Just figure out, all right, cool. He's dealing with a different drummer every other month. They got a new opener and everything. So it's like, let me just let them know, man, yo, I respect what you got going on. If there's anything, any way I can add value to what you got going on, if you want to just hang out, let me know. And then that ended up turning into a great relationship, like for me. And he introduced me to the other members of the band. He introduced me to Bruno. He just, we hung out. So that's somebody that I could call if I ever need anything. I would just, you know, go talk to front of house, meet the lighting guys, meet everybody, just yeah. make myself accessible and just let everybody know, like, yo, it's a, it's an honor to be here. Like, thank you for having me. You know what I'm saying? Just so they know who I am and just not being annoying, not asking for anything, just being appreciative, you know, taking advantage of the moment. And just if it's any way I could add value. And then sometimes that could turn into you adding, being able to add value on a whole nother situation. Right. So I just took that approach with things. And that honestly helped me to be just a, a better person off my instrument, which is very important in, in our field of what we do. Well, I, I want people to really kind of hear, you know, Darius, what you're saying, because the, the fact that you are, you are aware of the importance of integrity and core values and the kind of people that we need to be to associate and create relationships, that's what's going to really kind of bring people closer into your world when they really believe in the, the true value of who you are as a person. It totally starts there. With that true value as a person, when you can deliver and play the way you play and get behind and play a pocket that is endless, that on top of it just makes the combination so much more attractive. Definitely. It's like it's like the 80-20 rule, honestly. It's like, for me on tour, it's like I play 20% of the time and then 80% of it is the time spent with the other band members or the crew or flying or traveling. So if that 80% of it is not good then the 20 percent of it is definitely not going to be good so <laughs> i try to make sure i get that 80 percent as cool as i can to where what i've been practicing my whole life to do which is the 20 percent, can come effortlessly and i could help everybody else around me get their 20 percent up as much as they can boy that, that's i've already put my ten thousand hours in so absolutely and and we, we you've put your ten thousand hours in but you're continuing to build on that ten thousand hours that's for sure Oh, daily, yeah, daily. <laughs> you know, daily. I've got I've got a question I want to bring up here. This is from Carlos Gutzman. Carlos Gutzman is a phenomenal drummer himself. He's also a drum tech for all of the top top you know drummers that are out there. And he says, mm -hmm. he lives in Miami. He says, Darius, playing in a huge arena. How did you adapt your playing so you could keep your endurance throughout the show, so you could keep your technique flowing without tensing up? And can you also touch upon your live setup with these different artists? What do you use, in, you know, your drum kit and the live setup, which mm -hmm. brings to, to a great, great question. So talk about first about, about just your adapting to your endurance. Yeah, well, to, to be honest, for me, it's like if, if, you, if you stay ready, you won't have to get ready for me. So when I got the call for the stadium arenas, my, my, I've already conditioned my endurance beforehand to get there to know you know so you don't kind of want to wait until you get the call to do what you have to do to get ready that's a lot of the reasons why i got calls at a younger age but techniques that i would say for you to do to get your endurance up in this time is definitely definitely go through your rudiments figure out different ways that you could incorporate them around the drums yeah. to where you're 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 flowing so it's not just mundane if you could flow around the drums and get your rudiments feeling comfortable and create fun exercises for them to resonate with you 
because that's what I that's what I do. I I'll take a rudiment or take a, a exercise and I'll make it my own way. Right. I was like, all right, cool. I'll do whatever on the on the left foot, do this on the right foot, and then just do the rudiments. So if you could just figure out, you know, your different tempos, use a metronome, flow up and down with it. And when you feel tired, slow down mm-hmm. and play it at a comfortable level to where you're more in control. And then from there, gradually try to speed back up. That's how you'll be able to get your endurance. Just always try to have more control of what you're doing and just play. Play for a long period of time because when you're going to be on these stadium tours and doing these things, you're going to be playing maybe two, three shows a night. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're there. They're going to want the drums to feel like the track. You know, well, not two or three shows a night, maybe like two or three shows a week. I meant two or three shows a week. So yeah, yeah. Sometimes maybe two shows a night if you want to go out and chill with your buddies or do whatever. Or if you're like some guys, you could get clinics on your off days. You know, you could set up clinics on your off days. By you know, you go guys like that, their endurance is already up. Well, that's so great. Just great good advice. So focus on working on things like that. So preparation is everything. Be as far prepared. as my, my live setup. Oh. Go ahead, Dom. I'm sorry. So, that's right. So so what you're saying is preparation is everything. You got to really be prepared. So when you hit that stage, you're given 100% immediately. Yeah, definitely. Nice, nice. Let's talk about your, your setup now. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Great, great question. Your setup. What kind of setup? You know, Mapex drums. What Mapex drums are you using now? Well, when I'm on the road, I like to keep it simple with backline, unless you know I bring my own kit personally. But I love to play Saturns. I love Saturns. I love a 10, 12, 16. I like to keep it simple. Real, real Aaron Spears. 10, 12, 16. I love 13 by seven snares, and I love to have a, a 14 by five. I love all Black Panther snares. Um, I just recently played the um, new design kits. The design Lab. Crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah, I just I just did a video shoot with a uh, Tone Stiff on those. So I was just talking to Mark. I'm I'm gonna order. <laughs> I'm gonna order some of those. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> but yeah, man, I love to keep it simple unless it's um un. Unless it's a situation that requires more, I might add a gong drum or I might add an eight. Um, but aside from that, I just love to give the record what it what it needs. And I really am into playing triggers heavily. So I love to play rolling triggers. I'll have either triggers on my gong drums or always on my kick, always on my snare. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Saturn's. Saturns, I love Saturns, man. It's like how, how, well, it's, it's so easy to tune. Is they're right there for you. They're so consistent. The, the be, behind me back here is a Saturn Five over here uh, behind this field drum over here, and what I have to my left here is an Evolution, a new Evolution, and that's a whole nother level of sound that Mapex has put out. But uh, and all the 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 Black Panther. Yeah, stuff. I can't wait to come over and play that Evolution, Dom. <laughs> We're gonna get your tail here. And you're gonna hop on this kit for sure, and uh, but all the stuff like you had mentioned that yeah, man. you had played a, a, a panther snare drum early on, which is one of the first things that kind of connected it to Mapex. The first drum set. I don't know if you. I don't know if you remember those old Mapexes. It was 12, 13, 16, 22 inch kick, and the kick had those like wood hoops. Yes. Yes. On both sides. That is the drum set that I grew up on in my church. Like, I have documentation. My dad has so much footage of me on those drums. I still have the kit, actually, in storage at, at my mom's. Man. But So it's like Mapex was literally surrounded by me my whole life. And I went through different seasons of touring and working with different artists, finding my sound. So I've, I've, played, every, I've played every kit on my back line. Mm. I've played Yamahas. I've played DWs. I've I, except for Tama, I never really did the Tama, but I'm very, very well versed in drums and sound. And Mapex is just the most consistent and most personable drums for me. Like my personality speaks volumes on those drums. I've never felt more comfortable and more myself 
playing Apex. And it speaks volumes when I'm when I'm recording and doing shows. Like I've never had so many engineers to speak highly of my drums. Like when we listen to the playback artists, like man, the drums sound so good. It wasn't until I really made that consistency with Mapex and really, really like dove in and found how to get what I love out of it. Yeah. Because you can really get whatever sound out of these drums that you want. Like <laughs> Oh, it's 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 really it's it's an amazing company with amazing people. I mean, it, it, which on top of all that here, let's talk about now a couple of things. So, uh, yeah. where did you do some stuff with Kanye? Yeah, so my uh, work with Kanye started, thankfully, by me moving out here to LA and being a local out here. He started something which was called Sunday Service. A lot of people might know about that. It's been you know impactful all over the world, traveled everywhere. It's basically a collective of all of the industry and just world's most talented and just blessed singers, musicians, lighting directors, managers, everything. He basically formed a choir to just give inspiration and uplift the world. And a good friend of mine, Rico Nichols, and I, we do the percussion and drum aspect for that. Um, shout out to Roland as well. He also was interested instrumental um in that also but it's been definitely a, a great thing it's progressed also to me being able to do studio work uh production and stuff with kanye as well mm. um so yeah definitely keeping him in in our prayers as well for sure. Fantastic. so let, let's talk about about being now a musical director whereas this is now a whole nother level of responsibility of not just being a side man to come in but now as an md a musical director you got a whole nother list of, of responsibilities. So was Buster Rhymes your first musical director position? Yeah, that was my first major TV musical director position. Right. That was my first time um, on like a major level. I've done musical directing like for indie artists and, you know, artists of, uh, you know, lesser budgets and things like that. But my, my first time getting a call to actually do something televised where, you know, I got to really communicate and I'm in all the emails. I'm with the TV production emails. I'm with the lighting emails. I'm with every, you know, I got to handle everything. So that was my first time doing that this year and during a pandemic as well. So um, Anderson Pack was a part of that as well. It was for Jimmy Fallon and also a uh, New Year's Eve ball drop performance. So it was a great thing. We taped both performances in the same day. <laughs> it was amazing. So they did like a whole outfit switch and so it's like double work, same days. The pandemic, shout out to the pandemic, figuring things out, you know, how to keep things rolling. But that was that was my first time ever doing something on that level, putting the band together for that, handpicking everybody. Shout outs to Rebecca Foster, who was also the production manager for 50 for years ago, who called me for that. So it's all about relationship. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you mentioned that, and it really is all about relationships, but it's all about relationships only if you know how to be a positive person with a healthy attitude to have a good relationship. Yeah. Because yeah. it's also, the lesson is, yeah. bad relationships will bury you in this business immediately. Mm -hmm. You gotta have integrity. I mean, and that, that, that level of integrity and core values and good values, that, that's where you're coming from. So, so you, now you did the, you know, doing television, being an MD for a television show, what was that like as far as the intensity of, of being able to have everybody, you know, having the right band there, having the right look there, the right sound? Yeah, man, it's totally important because TV is like what you present. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, and everybody's there. Everybody is professional. Everybody's there to do their cues. Everybody's there to do their job. So when you're in that, that intensity and that, you know, energy, you want to bring forth your best you because everybody else is, yeah. you know, you don't want to, if it's basically having a body, if this arm is chopped off, you're going to feel it. So I was the part of the body that handles the music. So I needed to make sure my mindset was right. I was able to be, you know, approachable, you know, if, if things went wrong, like it was even a, a, a situation where um, I had sent in the edit I thought I got all the curse words out, but there was still some curse words and you can't really have curse words on TV. So I'm, I'm now I'm responsible for that. I never really had to be responsible for the, for the vocal edits. I'm like, I'm worried about this music right now. Like, and you can't even really hear the curse. So I'm like, 
literally like 10 minutes before we're doing a performance. I got to bounce out a new edit. I'm still trying to make sure my drums are set up at this point. Like I'm comfortable, but I'm got to worry about other things. So I was like, this is just too much. This is just too much. But at the end, it was a, it was a success. Yeah. Everybody was happy. It was like, all right, cool. It just showed me for next time how to be more prepared, you know, just how to how to handle things. All right, maybe you might need to just check or just check it over a couple more times before you, you know, like. So it was definitely a learning and growing experience for me, and everything turned out well. The artist was well pleased. Everybody was happy. So it was it was definitely great. I can't wait to do it again. Well, how how powerful. Well, now now with that learning experience, you're ready to, and prepared to know what to expect. Now, what happens when was Tone Stiff the next MD that you got? Yeah, Tone Stiff is a is an amazing artist. Actually, um, he started out as a songwriter. He still is a songwriter. He's uh, well known for writing like two of Chris Brown's biggest records. Yeah. Um, RCA has ended up giving him a nice situation to where they're pushing him as an artist. He's got amazing music coming out. He plays like three instruments. He plays piano. He plays drums. He plays yeah. bass. He plays guitar. I think he plays more instruments. He's a producer, so he's like a well-versed musician. And I've been blessed to be in position to uh, music direct for him as well. There's lots of content on uh, YouTube at the moment that you can check out if you type in Tone Stiff. There's going to be a lot more content coming out as well. He has an EP coming out. And uh, when things open up, you're going to be seeing a lot more of, you know, festivals and things like that. He actually opened up for her on um, her last tour. Oops. So... With COVID being slowed down, it's put a halt on things. But when everything opens back up, you're going to be seeing a lot more things coming from Tone Step for sure. Boy, fantastic! Now, and I want, I want to, you know, with, with Meta now. Now you're also doing musical directing for Meta. Yeah, also, also musical directing Meta. Meta is a new up and coming artist, uh, amazing vocalist. She's 21. She's based out of Indianapolis. She lives in L.A. now. These are both uh, things that I've been able to acquire living out here in L.A. and just networking yeah. with different people. And their managers are people that I've been in relationship with for long periods of time. So it's just a trust factor. But Maida is also a new up-and-coming artist. She just released a couple new singles um, and new videos. She's actually, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if I'm, a, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. Uh, <laughs> I think so. She's going to be doing... Uh, the national anthem for March Madness, so uh, you can check that out. Oh, fantastic! Um, yeah, you know, just little things like that. With with new artists, they tend to you know put them on that path and that course. But I've been blessed enough to be in the industry to know and see like when an artist is really gonna go. Like with Camila Cabello, I was working with her on the tour before anybody knew who she was. Like her biggest singles were released while I was on tour with her. So it's just I just I've been blessed to just really know and feel when certain things are are really great. So if you love music, I would definitely uh, encourage you to check those two artists out. Well, sure. I, I want everyone to kind of check them out and be aware of that. You know, as these new up and coming artists come out, you know, with yourself, you know, Darius, you know, driving that groove behind them, it's only going to make it guaranteed that's going to feel good. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I actually uh, made a, she just performed, we just did a performance on the Roots Picnic with Quest Love. They they do that festival every year. This year it was a virtual performance. It was hosted by Masego. So she, we just did a nice virtual performance in East West Studios. We put that together and she's got an amazing response from it. Some of it is on YouTube as well. So if anybody wants to check that out, that's that's something that you could check out as well. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, everyone goes and checks it out, man, for sure. I'll tell you something. Darius, it's absolutely incredible to have some time with you. And your YouTube channel, which is Darius Woodley on YouTube, I want everyone to go there and search that because you got some great stuff on there. Go there and subscribe to his channel. You're on all social media so people can track you down on what you're doing. And I think it's fantastic that you are a, a, a young leader in our wonderful drumming community that is absolutely inspiring the world with your talent and your ability man that's really really fantastic i appreciate that dom thank you man appreciate you so much it really is great well i want you to stay safe out there in la keep on playing we are going to be following you for sure i want everybody that joined us thank you so much for joining us this will be on it's good it's live now on mapex's facebook page but it'll go on to the mapex youtube channel soon so wow. You can see all the comments that you have here and the people that have viewed it and the, 
It's fantastic. Everyone, thank oh, you man. for joining us. Darius, thank you so much. I wish you well. And I just I just want to thank Mapex. I think Mapex, man, I'm so excited for the future and what's what's to come, even with, with more. This is just the beginning, man. Like Dom, I appreciate even the start of this relationship that we built, man. I I you're you're like you're like another brother to me now, man. I Absolutely. really appreciate this, man. Like, thank you, Mapex. Thank you, Mark. For real. Thank you, Bob Terry. Shout out to Bob Terry, man. Yeah. If if you're watching this, like I everybody, Rashid, for sure, man. Fantastic. Well, you know, you've got my number. If there's any way I can help you out, I'm a phone call away. You keep me posted when you get to the East Coast here in the New York area. We'll get together for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Darius Woodley, I wish you the best of luck. Stay well and stay safe, all right? Thanks, Don. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. <laughs>